next guest is Congresswoman Debbie Mocuso Powell. She discussed why she is running for the Senate and why her policies are going to be so important if elected. She also discussed protecting our communities, especially our Haitian community that has been under attack. Take a look. We're so happy to be here with our U.S. Senate Democratic candidate, Ms. Debbie Mocuso Powell. How Thank are you, you so today? much. I'm great. I'm on ca in campaign mode, you know, <laughs> traveling all over the state. Thank you so much for having me. No, thank you for coming back. You were here within our pilot episode, so we're so excited to have you back as you have won the primaries. How does it feel to secure that win? Well, first of all, I'm grateful. Grateful for the incredible amount of support that I've received all across the state. And we filed to run for Senate. I filed over a year ago and we have been all over the state. I've been traveling to make sure that people get to know who I am. Someone that came here, you know, from South America. My mom brought me here for opportunities to work hard, to be able to live in a safe environment in a free and free democracy where you can actually work and achieve your dreams. And those are the opportunities that I'm running to protect. And I want to make sure that Floridians understand that. And so I'm so grateful, so grateful to have gotten such strong support. Um, it also shows that what we're doing is working, yes. communicating with the people that have been felt like they've been left behind. Yes. Yes for too long here in our state. So I'm excited and now we're working to make sure that everybody comes out to vote on November 5th and reminding everyone, right, that they have to remember that they have the power. They have that individual power to make the changes in their lives by exercising their right to vote, by lifting up their voices. And so that's, that's my message now everywhere I go. Now, you discussed the importance of changes, right? Because we see in our democracy, there's been sometimes a little bit of tradition, right? And, and not the change that we want to see. You are mm -hmm. going up against um, an extremely <laughs> well-known incumbent, Rick Scott. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that you recently had said, because he had put $10 million mm -hmm. into TV ads, you said, instead of putting these false attacks ads on TV, let's discuss the issues. Exactly. So what are the issues that you're going to focus on on your first day in office if you secure this win? So before, before I get to the issues, right. I, I just want to say, say it's if we want a true representative democracy mm -hmm. we need to make sure that people can can't just buy their seats to serve in politics to serve in the Senate Rick Scott has been in office for 14 years and he oversaw the largest Medicare fraud in the history of this country and he's been using that money to put on TV to lie to Floridians and so let's talk about uh, what he proposed for Medicare and Social Security. He wrote a plan that would eliminate Medicare and Social Security and raise taxes to middle class families. And so let me just say I will never do that. I am not going to raise taxes to middle class families. I'm completely against that and I want to make sure that we protect Medicare and Social Security. Um, we need to pass the Voting Rights Act. People have asked me, what's the first thing that you would do? And I think that we need to come together, hopefully in a bipartisan fashion, to protect the pillar of our democracy, which is fair and free elections. We have been uh, under attack in the state of Florida with gerrymandered maps, where the governor and the legislature actually drew maps that threw people off their seats. And that's not a true democracy. We should allow people to elect who they want to represent them, not uh, the other way around. We need to make sure that we stop with voter suppression. So that's one piece of legislation that we need to pass. I want to make sure that we protect a woman's right to choose. It's something that we are now seeing facing in the state of Florida where a lot of women are facing life and death situations because of such an extreme ban on reproductive freedom for women. Um, and of course, making sure that we bring good paying jobs, growing our economy. Uh, people here have been living in a, under an affordability crisis because of high and skyrocketing property insurance rates. We need to not only lower those, those prices for insurance, which there's a bill that I can propose in the Senate that would lower that by 25%, but we need to bring companies that are willing to invest in our state and provide good paying jobs. There, there's a way for us to grow our economy. The problem is that we have politicians like Rick Scott that are only using that seat for his own self-enrichment and self-gain and not really working for all of us. And, and when you were mentioning about one of these key issues, 
in discussing about working for all of us, you talked about reproductive health, and one of the biggest things on the ballot is Amendment 4, mm -hmm. right? We're looking at this access uh, to being able to receive an abortion, reproductive rights for women, mm -hmm. and so, but I think because we're on Island TV, right, the Caribbean population, um, it's taboo to discuss this topic, yeah. right? Because a lot of people think, well, Amendment 4 is just about abortion, or it's yeah. just about, but yeah. what do you say to the Caribbean population about those who are hesitant, whether it be supporting yourself mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. we're supporting this amendment? So the first thing is I'm Catholic. Mm -hmm. I have three children. I'm a mom. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what I would do in that situation. I've never had to face that choice. Uh, I've been very fortunate that I had healthy pregnancies. But here's, here's what I've seen in Latin America, and I'm sure a lot of Caribbean nations, the same thing. The reproductive issue for a woman is central to our health care. And it should be a decision between the woman, her family, her doctor, her faith, and the government should never interfere. We are living under one of the most extreme bans on abortion at six weeks when most women don't know they're pregnant. And what's happening now is that we're hearing stories from women that are being turned away by their doctors because of this ban they go home, they have a miscarriage, they lose half their blood, and some of them almost died. I mean, we just heard a story like this from Miami, here Correct. in Miami, in the United States of America. Oh, and so yeah. in Latin America, we passed laws to protect that right for a woman because it was linked to high rates of violence, high, race, high rates of maternal mortality rates. So the Caribbean population, you know, you don't have to make that choice if you don't want to. But the government should never decide what you can do in your private life, especially for a woman and her health care. Do you feel as though that people have lost hope in regards to America, exactly of what's been going on between reproductive health, between uh, affordable housing, between this, this yeah. right to be able to choose? Do you feel as though a lot, because choice is not even just about when we talk about reproductive health, but in general, where am I gonna live? How can I be exactly. able to afford things? Do you feel as Americans we have lost hope? And how do you feel that we can restore it? Yeah, so there's a lot of apathy. And the, the reason for that is there are a few things going on. First of all, there's so much chaos, so much division, so much hate hatred in our political environment that people completely disengage and they feel that the government is not working for them and so if they don't feel like anything's changing in their lives they disengage but the problem is that if you don't vote if you're not engaged these politicians that have been in office for years like Rick Scott that have done nothing for you that have done nothing to make your life better will continue and will make it worse and so we can never lose hope we can never stop fighting for our rights um, I am so ashamed of some of these politicians attacking our Haitian American community oh, so that's my next and <laughs> you know as an immigrant myself yeah. I know the pain that comes from leaving your home country and the Haitian American community has have built the state of Florida. I mean, they're entrepreneurial, they're business owners, they're nurses, they're doctors, uh, they're teachers. I, I can't understand how Rick Scott has continued to spread these lies, these shameful, hateful attacks, instead of doing something about the situation in Haiti. And, you know, th there's a lot that we need to do. It's a, it's, an, it's a country that's only a few hundred miles away from our coast here in Florida, and it's as though people have forgotten about what's going on in Haiti. We have to stop the drug trafficking, the gun trafficking, these gangs are coming to the United States to buy guns, specifically to the state of Florida, and then they go back. Why isn't Rick Scott and other politicians talking about that instead of um, using hateful rhetoric to refer to a community that's so strong and who, that's the backbone of our economy in South Florida? You know, it's, it's very funny that you say um, that because I always tell people sometimes it's beyond politics. You know, for example, when we look at what Rick Scott said in regards to, for some who might not know, of course, the rhetoric by J.D. Vance and Donald Trump claiming that Haitians eat cats and dogs, that they are not legally um, there in Springfield, Ohio. Uh, Rick Scott says, I do know, I do know, don't know exactly what's happening in Springfield, but some people don't like it. And so it's not condemning yeah. really the situation. No. And, and I will take a moment of privilege as a proud young Haitian American. We do not eat cats and dogs. <laughs> we mm -hmm. are extremely hardworking. And the um, Haitians in Ohio are legal. And so yeah. it, you know, like I said, beyond politics, extremely upsetting. And 
what do you say in regards to the comment that Rick Scott made and just in general some yeah. politicians completely kind of brushing it over the rug well, because this is an immigration issue that we're facing. If you don't condemn it, you are complicit in supporting it. I mean, it's that clear, especially when you have a position of power. If you're not saying anything, if you're trying to run away from it, it's because you support that type of rhetoric. And that rhetoric incites violence. I mean, we saw what happened in Springfield after uh, Donald Trump accused, or J.D. Vance started spreading these lies about the Haitian community. Some schools were under threats from Correct. of bomb threats. Correct. We cannot allow that language to be used. And Rick Scott um, has been using these terms against immigrants as as a way to dehumanize, which is also very dangerous, and uh, to use it as a political attack, right? I mean, they're using it to create some hatred towards these communities because people uh, have been suffering economically. That's the truth here in the state of Florida, and they're using immigrants as a tool to blame that. And it's not, it's just not real, it's not a fact. And it's shameful that they're doing that because it creates more hatred and division in our communities. Now, before we head to commercial, because this is such, um such a hard time, especially when it comes to immigration, especially in South Florida. What do you say to immigrants that are hesitant to vote because of the rhetoric that is going on and all of the black, like just the rhetoric that has hurt them each and every day and they're hesitant to vote because they don't trust the government now? Well, let me tell you, as an immigrant myself um, who has seen firsthand the opportunities in this country. I mean, I, I was elected to serve in the House of Representatives and it was an incredible honor. And you can reach your potential in this country if we're engaged, if we support one another, if we make sure that we work towards that. If you disengage, if you're not a part of the conversation, you're going to be left behind. And what the other side is offering right now is deporting millions of undocumented immigrants, maybe people that have been waiting for a legal pathway for decades. I mean, we're talking people that have been living here for 30 years right. that they just have not had a pathway to have th their documents, but they're working and they're here and they've been waiting and we haven't provided that legal pathway. But at the same time, yes, of course we need border security. Of course we need to protect our nation. It's a matter of national security to make sure that we have a strong border. Rick Scott voted against border security. There was a bill, it was a bipartisan bill. Republicans and Democrats had written this bill to bring funding for the border. That would also provide legal pathways by investing also in more judges and more immigration attorneys. He voted against it. So um, again, using it as a political weapon. Immigrants in this country have created who we are right now, We're, and especially in Florida. We're a diverse state. We have the Caribbean community. We have the South American community, Central American community. It's, it's a, an incredibly diverse state that has always worked closely together for the future of our families. And now we're seeing that everyone is just, you know, at odds with each other because of politicians like Rick Scott, because of that rhetoric that we've been hearing for so long. And it has to stop. Indeed, it has to stop. <laughs> I'll tell you that part, indeed. After commercial, we'll talk a little bit of why the U.S. Senate race is so linked to the presidential race after this commercial. Thank you for coming back to us here on On Set with Kelly. We are here with U.S. Senate candidate, Congresswoman Debbie Mokasel Powell. We discussed a lot within the first half from issues that are important to her campaign and to Americans, um, as well as the rhetoric that's been going on about Haitian Americans in America and why the immigration system is so important. And so these issues are obviously key to the presidential election, right? We're looking at uh, Vice President Kamala Harris versus Donald Trump. And so why do you feel that your race and the presidential race are so linked together and their importance for voters to see. So, and I was, it's funny because I was just thinking about this today that there's a lot of progress that has been done and sometimes it takes a little bit of time for people to feel that. Right. But a perfect example of something that just happened. It's an administration that really truly is serious about working for the people, right? Um, there was a strike that we were hearing about the, you know, the port strike and they came to an agreement and it stopped within a few days. And that's not easy to do because you have a lot of workers that are very upset that are on strike and it could have affected the supply chain. 
Well, the administration figured it out and they stopped it. They have been creating more jobs. There was a very good job report. Um, they want to continue to lower the price of medicine. We capped the insulin cost at $35. And I know that this is important for our communities, for our immigrant communities. Um, you know, there is higher rates of diabetes among Latinos, about Caribbean, um, among the Caribbean community. So this is an important issue. And if the Republicans, if Donald Trump gets back into the White House, if Rick Scott gets back into the Senate, they want to repeal that. So insulin costs will go back up because they're very aligned with big pharmaceutical companies. I mean, these big pharmaceutical companies are their allies. They're their friends. They're the ones that are paying for their campaigns. And these ads that you see on television, people need to understand that that money is what's influencing many times our political system. So the people has to, they have to grab back that power, right? And participate. If you want to continue to see lower costs in medicine, Kamala Harris needs to be elected. I will continue to support that work. If you want to protect Medicare and Social Security, if you want um, to have people that are going to find ways to bring good paying jobs to our state, to lift up Caribbean communities, um, we have to be proud of who we are. You know, we can't allow this rhetoric to make us feel like we're less than or disengaged. We need to be proud of the work that we've done in this community. And, and I can tell you, I mean, you know, being a Floridian, I'm, I'm, it, it makes me, it fills my heart with pride to see the diversity that we have here. And so we need to make sure that we lead the nation in solar panels, for example, where the Sunshine State, that could lower the price of electricity. There's a lot that we can do. The, the problem here is that the other side, they're not proposing anything. They don't have a plan. Their only plan is to attack, vilify, dehumanize, divide, so that they can continue to be on power. You know, you mentioned about attacking and, and just in general dehumanizing people. And one of the pieces of rhetoric that we hear with Donald Trump accusing of Kamala Harris not being black or not being of her heritage what and whatnot, and also just in general her being a woman. Now you being a woman running, right, running for office, yeah. she being a woman running for office, yeah. there's a lot of young girls that look up to you all. Yeah. And so what is the message that you give to the younger generation, especially young women, who might want to take your place one day, right, who might want to have this seat or are questioning exactly how to vote and why it's so important. Um, the first thing that I would say is don't ever let anyone tell you that you can't do any, do something that you want to do, that you feel in your heart that you can do. Don't, uh, don't let anyone demean you or make you feel less than. Um, I, I have to be honest, for years I've been told no. For years uh, I was told no, you can never go to Congress. You can't beat that Republican back in 2018. But I knew the community really well and I felt, I felt that we could do it together and I wanted to do it and we did it. And it's the same thing running for Senate. People think I can't defeat Rick Scott. No, you can't do it. I know I can do it. And that's the, the lesson that I want my daughters and every young girl to know that if you want to do something and if you believe you can, and if you have your community behind you, anything is possible. Uh, but it starts with you and it starts with having a strong, strong heart because this world is difficult. And for women, it's still very difficult for us to reach uh, positions of power, whether it's in government, in the corporate boardroom, in business, we don't have an even playing field. We just do not. And I've seen so many so much criticism of the vice president asking if she's qualified well she's one of the most qualified candidates this country has ever had she was the attorney general in california served in the senate vice resume. president <laughs> vice president of the united states yes yes she has the experience that yes. we need yes uh, the question is already demeaning to a woman and uh, women tend to feel that maybe we're not as qualified when we usually have much much higher qualifications than many of the men that are already serving right. in in the Senate or in Congress. Mm -hmm. um, I'm the first Latina to be at the top of the yes. ticket. That's crazy to me. We, yes. I shouldn't be the first, and I definitely don't want to be the last. And one thing that we need to also learn to do is support one another as women. We need to come together and make sure that we lift each other up, and that's the way that, that every girl will be able to reach her potential. 
we have to lift each other up because if we don't, <laughs> it's yeah. not going to yeah. look pretty. I always tell kids at work, I tell them all the time, you have to make sure to come together because yeah. if you don't come together, yeah. you know, what, what can happen, right? And so my question is, there's a lot of voters, especially young voters who are undecided. They feel as though, well, Trump, you know, gave me my stimulus check <laughs> and Kamala Harris. Yeah. Some, some of them might say, oh, she hasn't done anything or maybe she has done yeah. something. There's a lot of different comments going around. Um, and so to the undecided voters or just people in general, it doesn't have to be children, but just undecided, whether they be the elderly, mm -hmm. whether it be, you know, those who are ages 40, 50, whatever it may be, what do you say to the undecided voters yeah. who might not know which side? Um, I ask them what their top issue is. I usually have this conversation and for young voters all over the state, I hear the same things. I can't afford to pay my rent. I'm worried about housing. Well, look at who's been in control of housing in the state of Florida. It's been the Republicans who've been in control. It's been uh, the governor that we have now. It was Rick Scott when he was governor. He's been in office 14 years. The only way that you're gonna have people advocating for you to bring more affordable housing, workforce house housing, make sure that these hedge funds are not purchasing all these homes and then uh, selling them at such high prices that people can't afford to buy their first home is if you elect Democrats. Um, if you care about climate change, and this is a very important issue for a lot of young people, look at what just happened with Helene. They, it mm. devastated our state. Rick Scott is a climate denier. Donald Trump is a climate denier. They will do nothing, and these storms continue to become more and more severe. We need people that are going to invest in green energy, and it's it's an economic opportunity for us to do that. It, it creates great paying jobs, and you don't even have to have a college degree, many of these jobs. If we bring solar panel manufacturing to the state, I mean, there are things that we can do, but you have to address the issue of climate change, protecting our environment. And finally, gun violence. Mm. For me, that's very personal. I lost my father to gun violence. We can't continue to live in a country where we have such high rates of gun violence killing our children. C uh, communities are affected by this every single day. There's community violence everywhere because of these lax gun laws that we have been facing here in the state of Florida. We need to pass a universal background check uh, finally at the federal level so that we don't allow criminals to have easy access to weapons. And, and by the way, this has nothing to do with the Constitution, the Second Amendment. I support the Second Amendment. It's responsible gun ownership. So if you're listening and you're young and you're thinking, oh, no, do not listen to social media. Do your own research. Talk to people. Get the information you need. The only way out of where we are right now is with new leadership and change. And that's beating Rick Scott in November and making sure we elect Vice President Kamala Harris. Now, you mentioned about the Second Amendment because, you know, the biggest issue that I see when it comes to the gun violence issue is people saying, well, you're taking away my guns, you're taking away our rights, nope. you're taking away our freedom, you're taking away mm -hmm. everything that the Constitution has, Constitution has uh, created for us. And so what do you say when it comes to understanding that the Constitution is that document in order of yeah. us to follow, of course, yeah. but at the same time to know that there are issues that are pertinent to our generation, to the older generation. What do you say to that? Yeah, I, no one's touching the Constitution. I mean, the only person that I've heard promote any changes to the Constitution is Ron DeSantis, by the way. They wanted to have some sort of constitutional uh, meeting. No, we respect gun ownership. Uh, Giffords, an organization yes. that I worked with, they had 100,000 members that own guns. It's not about prohibiting the sale of guns to people that are going to have a license, a permit, training, right? That, I mean, it's responsible gun ownership. But why are we allowing in these gun shows for anyone to walk in without a background check and then leave? And that's part of the problem that we've seen with all the gangs that have come to Florida to buy, from Haiti, to buy right. guns. There's a high There's rate of gun there. trafficking Correct. going on. I mean, that's why we need better laws. It's about safety. It's about making sure that our children are protected. We need to protect children's lives above the gun lobby. 100%, 100%. Our lives are at stake. And like I tell people all the time, it's beyond politics at this point. It's the life that is important. We need to make sure that our, especially our kids, are protected in the schools. Because when I have my mom, I don't want to be worried sending my kids to school. Yeah. That's the last thing that I want to do. Um, and so my final question to you is, because, of course, Island TV, our Haitian population, right, we're, we're, we're making sure to definitely take precedent about that. Because 
what has been happening has hurt a lot of us, right? It's it's taken a lot. So what is your message to the Haitian community um, about this race, about your race, about the presidential race, and just in general moving forward in democracy? Um, I've been in, in such close contact with some dear friends who are Haitian American leaders here in our community, and my message is, you will have an ally in Washington, D.C., if I have the honor of representing all of you in the Senate. Uh, I will always protect the interests of our Haitian American community here in the state of Florida. And I know, I know that they have felt like they've been left behind. Uh, but only somebody like myself that has been here and has witnessed firsthand who the Haitian American community is, how important and integral they are, you are, to our economy, to the, the culture of our state. And, and to understand that you have been in pain watching families and friends in Haiti suffer from gang violence. I mean, I just heard the news of yet another fire that these gangs were, you know, people died because of these fires. And we need to pay attention to Haiti. We need to figure out a way to support freedom, democracy, safety. We need to um, look at ways that we can continue to support also TPS for Haitians, yes. because I know that Rick Scott doesn't support TPS for Haitians, and that's ex that's very also troubling. Wh where are we supposed to send Haitians to if they can't go back to their country because they're leaving violence? So there, there's a lot that we need to do, and for me, it's it's making sure that the Haitian community knows that they have an ally and an open door, that they can come to me and we can work together in making sure that we support Haitians abroad and the Haitian community here. And the last question, I know I said that was the last question, but in general, the for last. all of our voters yeah. in South Florida, right, who are looking to you, final message for them, for voters in general. Don't stay home. <laughs> yes. Do yes, not yes. stay home. Look, we we still have a system here in this country where, where you have a lot of opportunities to vote. You can vote by mail if you choose to. You can have early voting, two weeks of early voting. You walk in to any voting location, you present your ID, um, it's it'll take you 10 minutes with the ballot if you don't want to do that if something happens if you like voting on election day make a plan but vote if you want changes if you want to create a better future for your family for the state you need to be engaged you need to pay attention to who's running we have great candidates um, vice president Harris I'm running against Rick Scott but we also have excellent down-ballot candidates, candidates for sheriff in Miami-Dade County. Um, we have school board races. We need to take politics out of the classroom and support our teachers. Yeah. You need to be engaged. When you're engaged, when people are more engaged, we create a better society for our children. And so don't sit this one out. It may be the last time that we have an opportunity for change in our state. Yes, voter registration ends October 7th, so please make sure uh, <laughs> to vote, 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 vote. By the time this airs, it'll probably, yeah. <laughs> probably be yeah. over, but just in case for, for the for years to prior, just know that it ends in that uh, first realm of October. So, Congresswoman, thank you so much for your time. You, Best Kelly. of luck to you in your race, and continue to make the change that we need. Thank you all for tuning in to Onset thank with you. Kelly.